Have you ever had one of those days where you just wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, I really want to do my part to destroy the planet today, but I just don't have the energy to get off the couch. <laughs> and I'm definitely not getting up off the couch until I at least finish this marathon of uh, Here Comes Honey Boo. But what if I told you that you can now destroy the planet from the comfort of your own home? You've always been able to do it, actually. We've been doing it for millennia. Because every time we flip on a light switch, we hear the hum of the refrigerator, we do anything that makes our day-to-day -day lives comfortable at home, we do our part to put a little greenhouse gas up into the atmosphere. This number 350 here on the screen is the number that Bill McKibben says is the most important number in the entire planet, a number that every human being needs to know. This is the number that James Hansen and a group of climate scientists say that above this number of carbon dioxide parts per million in the atmosphere sustained for any given period of time, and we can no longer sustain the climate to which all of humanity, wildlife, and our biosphere has adapted. This is what I consider to be the most important number on the planet. Because this is the number that each one of us can impact every single day of our lives. This is the number that we can sit on the couch, finish the Honey Boo Boo Marathon, and if we focus on this number of zero emissions, we can impact 350. So we can indeed save the planet from the comfort of our own home. Stabilizing the climate, according to James Hansen, says that stabilizing atmospheric CO2 and climate requires that net CO2 emissions approach zero. So what he is telling us is that it's zero or nothing. This is our home. That's the Gauss family around 1915. The home was built in about 1901. The house is now turning uh, 112 years old. But that's not what the house looked like the day that we moved in. When we ran by this house one day, uh, my wife and I looked at that house and we said, that is our dream house. <laughs> Asbestos siding, zero insulation in the attic, except for a layer of newspaper dated 1902. <laughs> We had lead paint on all of the walls. We had windows that hadn't been opened for 20 years that were still painted shut, but still drafty enough to raise our utility bill. We had a refrigerator from 1989 that you could hear even when you were upstairs. We had a Mueller Climatrol furnace that was installed in 1957 that was never going to die and was operating at about 40% efficiency and in human terms, that means that we needed to heat a buckwheat pillow up in the microwave and stick it down at the end of our bed every night just to stay warm. And for the privilege of that, we got to pay $365 a month. So why is this number zero so important to target? Yogi Berra said that if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. So, inspired by one of my great heroes, Ray Anderson, we started our own Mission Zero. We said that by 2030, all homes, yours included, not just ours, would be supplied by 100% renewable energy, they would harvest their own water, they would create zero waste, and they would create a living space for people that sustains and restores the environment, not just harms it, but restores the environment. And this is what's possible, and this is what's exciting. This is my daughter, Jane. She will never know what it is like to grow up in a carbon-consuming home. She is the first generation to be able to make that claim. Because this is the home that she's growing up in. This is our home after our restoration with 8.1 kW of solar up on the roof. It is now the oldest home in America to achieve net zero energy. But I don't want to keep that title for long. USA Today called this home one of the best green homes of 2010. We've been written about in dozens and dozens of magazines and news shows and articles, and I've been on all kinds of shows to talk about these things. Uh, the Atlantic called it sustainable perfection, which is, I love that title, but we are not quite there to sustainable perfection yet, but we will be soon. So let's take a little walk back through the history of our house. This is Philip and Elizabeth Gauss. They are the parents of Gertrude Gauss, who was born in the parlor of our home and whom we bought our house from in 2006. 
This is the Grizz what is now the Grizzly Peak Brewing Company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, over in Washington, just around the corner from our home. It is also, at that time, it was the Philip Gauss Saloon. But the exciting thing about this photograph was not only was that the saloon of the owner of the home that we now live in, but you can see there, that is the day that our home was being wired for electricity. That was the first day that someone could flip on a light bulb and burn stored carbon energy to light their way. Now, Wendell Berry says when we move back, sometimes when we move back makes sense, then we move forward. Well, let's take a look back at our house. This is Robert Gauss, Gert's older brother, standing in our backyard around 1915. And you can see that the house and the property kind of recognize the patterns of nature because it had to. You can see the composting toilet over there, also known as the outhouse. I don't know what they did on a five-degree day in Michigan. We had, uh, we, we had a chicken coop that provided eggs. They also raised rabbits back there for meat. There was a garden in the back. We still have a garden now. There's a cistern that captured all the rainwater for all the agriculture and things that they were growing to supply their own home on the property. There was a small well that brought up fresh water for the small amount of fresh water that they needed each day to drink. But the Gausses were also burning 1,200 pounds of coal every single month. 100 pounds of ash alone. The products that they brought into their house were often made locally, right in downtown Ann Arbor. But they were taking all of their waste and dumping it into streams, so much so that to this day, that creek is now buried under the ground, and most people in Ann Arbor don't even know that creek exists. It is now officially a sewer that drains out to the Huron River. In colonial times, the average home was consuming 15 to 20 cords of wood to cook and heat their homes. That's a pile of wood, imagine this, four feet wide, 16 feet high, and 40 feet long, longer than the length of this stage. So within less than 100 years, the inexhaustible heart pine forests of Michigan were exhausted. This is Hermanville, Michigan in 1890. We destroyed all of the trees in Michigan in less than 100 years before the population of the world hit 1 billion. In the evolution of lighting, can we go back from where we are now, from the LED light bulb to the paraffin candle? Well, the paraffin candle burns 10 times the CO2 of an incandescent light bulb. And this is what all these incandescent light bulbs look like from space at night. It almost looks as if the world is on fire, because in a way it is. We're digging up hundreds of millions of years of stored solar energy and burning it and sending the gases up into the atmosphere. Of all of the energy consumed on Earth since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, astonishingly, half of that energy has been consumed in the past 20 years. We're going the wrong direction. We're moving away from zero emissions. Now, the challenge is that just in the U.S. alone, there's 130 million existing homes, and your homes, we consume about 25% of the energy in the United States. So the state of California has come up with a great solution, a really ambitious project that all new homes by the year 2020, just seven years from now, will be net zero energy. This is an amazing goal. Imagine that. All new buildings. But ask yourself this. If all new buildings... Every new house that is built starting this afternoon, from now until 2050, everything new is net zero energy. How much will that get us closer to that goal of under 350? Will that lower our current carbon emissions? And by how much? This is the number of how much it will reduce it. It will reduce it by nothing, because we still have those 130 million homes. We still have all the existing buildings. We still have this theater right here. Amory Lovin said that if something exists, it must be possible. So let me show you what exists and what's possible. This is actually the roof of our house where we produced 9,500 kilowatts of solar. We consumed 7,500 kilowatts of solar all over the past year, which sent a surplus back to the grid of over 2,000 kilowatts of energy. This is exciting because last month we got a negative energy bill of $88. Over the 30 years of our mortgage, we will have shifted our costs by $283,000. That's at 7% energy inflation. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, gosh, we have no idea what energy is going to be like in the future.
And that's exactly the point. We have no idea what the raw cost of coal or crude oil is going to be by the close of the commodities exchange this afternoon. But we do know what the raw cost of solar and wind will be 10,000 years from now. So it's a simple formula for all of us in our own homes. We just lose less, we use less, and then we produce. The first thing we did was we used, just used natural daylighting, uh, make sure all the blinds are open. In the shower, we converted our 2.5 gallon a minute shower head to 1.5 gallons a minute, saving us 16,000 gallons of hot water, reducing our energy consumption extraordinarily. Shifted all of the appliances to electric. Now we're decommissioning the last carbon consuming appliance in the house to induction. So it would be a 100% all electric home. And we're not hippies bathing in our pasta water, sacrificing and lower the heat down to 50 degrees at night. We are way more comfortable than the house than when we had that Mueller Climatrol, but we're smarter about it. We make sure we have the most efficient appliances. We make sure they're controlled properly by things like occupancy sensors and smart control systems. We restored our old windows and put weather stripping on them and added a low E glass to the outside. We insulated really well. We insulated on the walls and in the attic. We put in a geothermal system, the most efficient heating and cooling system on the planet. And then since we were an all electric home, it made sense that Ford would come out to our house and do uh, an issue of all uh, their all electric vehicle. So we got to be in the centerfold of uh, my Ford magazine. Now they're gonna be a little bit upset about this next photograph because up there, that's our brand new Chevy Volt. What's really exciting is you see right over here, this little black box, that's our GE watt station charging station, but it is plugged into our solar panels. So right that moment, it is filling up with a tank full of sunshine. And every day when we drive that car around Ann Arbor, we're being powered by current solar income. And of course, the last thing we did, we put in that 8.1 kW of solar. So, why is the number zero so crucial to get to? 290, this is the number that for over 800,000 years, that was the highest concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere leading up to the Industrial Revolution. This is a number, again, that we have to keep below if we want to maintain the climate to which we all adapted. 397, is where we peaked in June of this year. So the UN Convention on Climate Change did a little study. They decided to take all of the pledges that were voluntary that every country that committed to this pledge did for lowering their carbon emissions. And they wanted to know by 2100, if we all meet those targets that we've all pledged to around the globe, where will the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere be? And this was the number they came up with. That's a world with no ice. By 2100. This is my daughter, Jane. She'll be 92 in the year 2100. We're not talking about the storms of our grandchildren. We're talking about our storms. We're talking about our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes. Bill Bryson said that the greatest possible irony would be in our endless quest to fill our lives with comfort and joy that we created a world with had neither. But it's not an either or opportunity. By shifting to an emissions free, a carbon emissions free world in our homes, we can live better lives than when we were addicted to fossil fuels. And the exciting thing about this number zero when we really redefine home, is that when you, when you look at what my family has done in our house and you think, if we could do this here in Michigan, then anybody can. If anybody can, then everybody can, including you. Thank you.